The boomers. You will never get this house. Three balls, two strikes, pressure is on. This is where we discuss real estate, property improvement, and business. Together, we'll strategize on how to win. Welcome to the Full Count. Tim Dillon, comedian, hilarious guy. He's been going on a rant. This yeah. is the first generation <laughs> yeah. of people Having to watch attachments. World War II documentaries, yeah. to feel proud of accomplishments they never had and sacrifices <laughs> they never made. Yeah. And they would watch World War II documentaries and they'd feel very proud of themselves while eating a cake. Yeah, That's the boomers. They love a cruise. That's the boomers. Yeah. According to some articles I saw, baby boomers comprise about 20% of the population, but own about 38% of the homes because a lot of them don't want to sell their homes. And if they do want to sell, they want to sell at a very high price. So Tim Dillon goes in on that, on how baby boomers tend to act. But I think a lot of it has to do with just the human race. They're just, at the end of the day, we want as much money as possible. And it doesn't really matter if we see maybe if you're a baby boomer and you see a young family wanting to buy it and they ask for some help. Human nature is human nature. And they pick up the phone and the real estate agent goes, maybe we could do this. We can get you this. And they go absolutely not absolutely not you will never get this house for under 1.9 they refuse to leave because it's their biggest coup d'etat the, the the boomer having a mcmansion in in a place like long island is the thing that they have that allows them to they're the lord of the matter so a lot of like um a lot of these, what, what they're saying, and statistically speaking, is the truth, is that they don't want to downsize either. They want to have the big homes. Um, so we'll get into those articles in a second. A standard deviation more than the people in the back. They have a little bit of status, and maybe some of them are in first. Who knows? But they're all just traveling to some city where their children live, and they can go and judge them for how they live. Right. And they never make the connection that, oh, None of us have put our homes back on the market. Right, None of us have, God forbid, taken a little bit less and simplified our lives, you know, so that we have, we're effectively locking out. Because by the way, guess who loves the Black Rock and everybody giving everybody crazy money? The boomers. They go, yeah, you, you give me that two million. They love it. They love it. They'll tell you. One of the favorite pastimes of anyone over a certain age, they'll tell you what they can get for their house. <laughs> immediate you don't you don't even ask so what is your take on all that you know because the supply issue is a problem in the u.s and uh there's just not enough homes on the market especially the larger homes for families mm -hmm. or someone that wants to build a family they're just not enough for the most part i'm obviously not a boomer um yeah by definition uh but i do think it's very easy to just generalize a group of people uh for at, the first thing i would do is ask if, would people in our generation act the same way they acted? Yep. I would say absolutely. 100%. But I actually don't mean, first of all, I will relate as I, as I have gone through this and I'm going through this, just like everyone else who might have an issue with the boomers. It is the, our realities are different than when, how they had it. That's a fact. I mean, for me personally, there's a lot more people I would blame than like the middle class generation before, you know, I would blame all of them. There's this really cool site and I'll show you. It goes right into this. This is who I think of. And this is, instead of blaming the boomers, I think of this. Real quick, baby boomers are like 58 to like 78 years old. There's like two different types of boomers. Mm -hmm. But anyways, go ahead. This is, this, uh, and I told you, I, I wanted to share this, but I told you this like 10 episodes back and we never got around to it. Uh -huh. But this website is WTF happened in 1971. All right. So gold growth and product productivity and hourly compensation since 1948. Um, if you see compensation is this red line mm -hmm. and productivity is this line. There's mm -hmm. been an increase in productivity, but it's no longer growing, uh, growing at the same rate. This is from the economic policy Institute, uh, real GDP, real wages and trade policies in the U S Real GDP, that blue line that's still going up. Um, mm -hmm. Average real wage, CDP deflator, average real, like, so you can see um, something happened in 1971. Income gains widely shared in early post war decades, but not since then. Um, the red line is the top 1% of earners. 
something happened in 1971. And this is Gold, this right? would be in the boomer uh, era, right? Right. Um, it was under Nixon. Growth? Nixon um, right. removed it's, the it, gold from the reserve currency. Exactly. This is when we decided that we were going to separate uh, the dollar from any real material value, uh, which mm -hmm. then in turn gave the government the ability to do a lot of weird things. And they did right. this in the name that this is going to save us whenever there's an economic downturn. They'll have more control to turn things around. Kind of like what we're dealing with the Fed controlling interest rates and things like that, which is a big conversation these days. Um, but at what cost, right? Shares of gross domestic income down. Uh, mm -hmm. Income concentration at the top has risen sharply since the 1970s. Okay, so one thing I want you to keep in mind is that any politician you ever heard this complain about a problem, these all touch on those. Average black income, look, stagnant. A lot of people wouldn't think 1971, all of a sudden, there would be it would start going stagnant. In fact, a lot of people would have the opposite. So any politician who's ever campaigned on a debate stage has talked about how they're going to fix these problems. And so that's why I would just lean towards not blaming the boomer. I personally think that there's some other people that we can uh, we can blame. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it is uh, uh, I've, I, what is it called? Is it the, the gold standard or um, yes? Yeah, that, and that was actually originally separated kind of uh, by uh, Roosevelt, but it was just the death nail was done by Richard Nixon. Yeah, so I think partially that's to blame. I think uh, the, to blame is the government. It's not really a generation of yeah. people. They're just kind of the. Uh, feeling the effects, therefore they're reacting in different manners. But it is a it is factually said that boomers don't want to downsize overall. And mm -hmm. I'll show you the articles in a moment. But I think you are right where you want to go big picture because the big picture will give you more of the answer than just getting upset at that generation. Because mm -hmm. you're right, we would do the exact same thing, or humans would in general. You want the most for mm -hmm. your you know whatever you have asset, but a lot of it also has to do with. Uh, um, NAFTA, like, um, you know, our mm -hmm. manufacturing jobs went to Mexico and other places and China, Vietnam. So I think the real problem is globalism to many degrees is that, uh, a lot of people in this country, they don't have the jobs that they could have had before. And they're not getting paid that high anymore in general because of all the stuff overseas. And, um, I think that's the main issue. I think that's just the reaction to all that from the government. So that's, that's my my whole philosophy or my thoughts. No, that's a good point. And, and I think a counter argument to what I said could be, it could be that, hey, you know what, though? The boomers voted for those folks, Nixon and all them. But again, I turn it back to our generation. Don't we vote for people who put policies just as crazy as this in the place? And right. unless, unless you're like this huge Bitcoin purist, you're you're the same as the boomers, to be honest. Totally. I mean, look who we have in office, not just the president, but all these mm -hmm. other radical type people with constantly wanting to spend money, um, mm -hmm. which is just insane. Our, our, what is our debt now? 34 trillion, I think. And rising. And rising. So like we keep putting in morons too, or people our age and younger, whatever. And then um, the other thing is, like you said, the boomers that voted in these policies in a way, a lot of these politicians also continue to stay in office. Look at Diane Feinstein. We talked about that. She died holding that position. That should be totally illegal in mm -hmm. terms of like being there forever. Uh, there should be some type of ability to get fresh people or fresh minds in there, uh, or at least people that aren't tarnished in that um, part of government for so long because it gets corrupted. Right. So, yeah. I think, I think a lot of it has to play with that. Yeah. And look, the, uh, look, we the reason that we're like, dang, why do the boomers have these nice houses? Is because we want them, and um, but we also need them. People, young people need them. There's this uh, Eric Weinstein, I think is how you say it. He's a hedge fund, or he was a manager. Now he's all over podcast uh, philosopher, I guess to some degree. And he was saying how I was listening to a podcast, and he was saying he went to his dad's. Uh, friends his dad's 85 and he went to his mm -hmm. dad's friend's birthday party in a neighborhood where i think eric weinstein grew up 
And he was talking to all these elderly people, homeowners in the area. And they were like, you know, we used to, they told Eric, we used to have like 15 children constantly playing in the area. And now there's absolutely none. And he's like, you know how devastating that is and how bad that is for the community and overall. And they're like, well, yeah, it's perfectly suited for families. This neighborhood, these homes are great for them. And, you know, these people are like alone or with their spouse that are really elderly, um, but they just can't afford it. And do you really think humans are going to give a discount to a stranger to come in when they, even though they need that house, they're not, mm -hmm. they're going to look for the, the most money. So I think that's a problem. I think the other problem is, um, you know, I think it's very important that foreigners buy real estate in America, definitely. But at the same time, there should be some type of standard and placement. And I think we should talk about that um, maybe on the next episode about like farm. Farmland is being bought up by a lot of Chinese. Um, and that's that's an issue, just like they have a lot of ability with our pharmaceuticals. Now they're buying our farmland and have access to our agriculture and how to do certain things with it. And I think that's a big issue. You know, and you, you mentioned China. One of the things about China that's kind of not a secret is their population is going to be uh, declining very quickly um, in the next 10 to 30 years, somewhere in that area. Right. But I, I think the baby boomer thing, you would think the same thing's going to happen here, but I think uh, it is people well, aren't having kids. I think really. that I, I would think that, and you, and you know, those folks would go into nursing homes and the, the torch would be passed. Um, particularly with uh, the population decline, like it's been—I feel like it's been 340 million my whole my whole life, right? Um, it does seem that way. I've been saying 340 million for a very long time. Maybe not my whole life, but I feel like since 2007, we've been saying 340 million. Um, but I think that with the rate of immigration right now, that there may never be really that change of uh, a population, and that could be partly why they're doing it. Who knows? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I think I think a lot of the illegal immigration. Did you say illegal or, or immigration? I just said immigration. Um, but people can draw their own conclusions on what's right. legal and illegal. You know. I think a lot of the reason why they're allowing. I mean, not to go into like the political aspect, but I think a lot of the reason why, like for example, Ill illegal immigration is allowed is, or yeah, basically allowed is they're trying to replenish, obviously, jobs that a lot of young people aren't willing to do. And really? a lot of that also has to do with, in, in some ways, not uh, besides the political aspect of it, I'm not trying to go there. I'm just trying to stick to that. Um, but also, I think there is, they understand that there's a problem with not enough youth and the birth, the birth rate is going down. And that is a fact that it continues to go down. And that's a major issue. You know, I haven't looked into this at all, so I'm not arguing with you. I never really can. I guess I, I didn't haven't seen any evidence yet to think that there aren't young people who want the jobs. Well, a lot of it is low paying jobs, like absolutely low paying. But you know, a job that I really liked when I was young, and I think there's a lot of people that are 18 that are like me. I really liked uh, construction, residential construction. Um, drywall the only reason i got out is because you don't really get health insurance in those companies right but, you know living in southern california there was never a chance i, I could really imagine that i was going to be able to get a job in residential construction just i felt like it was almost exclusive to non-english speaking people mm -hmm. but i don't that's not based in fact i never went there with my resume or my application and said can i get a job here mm -hmm. but um i didn't know anyone in that industry but again I had done that when I was younger and I, I would think that there are kids that work at like McDonald's that would rather have a nail gun in their framing, you know? I don't know because like, um, I forgot the guy's name that the dirty jobs guy. I mean, Mike I Rowe. yeah, he was talking about how, um, I don't remember what year, but what decade, but I remember when I was in school in high school and like, and people before that too, students, it was frowned upon to be like in blue collar jobs, which is in those demographic of jobs that you're talking about and people push going to university and therefore a lot of people went to university and a lot of it was like university uh, or degrees that weren't really as valuable as they could have been and that blue collar specialist 
you know, that, that went down and that's why there's so much demand for like plumbers and things like that. But, um, so I guess that's, that's kind of what I'm kind of referring to the people filling in those jobs. Maybe you get one these days. I mean, it's not residential construction, but you get one of these union welder jobs like in Philadelphia. Oh, they pay in like 90 bucks an hour. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Which is like insane. Right. But I mean, props to them. But um, those are, I think those are more akin to a club because you have to like get in there, get, you know, certified. You have to get in, you have to know someone to get into these things based on mm -hmm. my research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never been to Philadelphia, but I, I, I have gone through the forums and watched people talk about what it takes to get into them. Right. But anyways, I think that was a good uh, discussion about it's very easy to alienate a, a large group of people, especially when they're, you know, for lack of a better term, on their way out. I remember when I, like, I remember like 10 years ago, 12 years ago, my dad was reading on the Internet that people don't <laughs> like people from his generation. And he was just so shocked. He's like, what did we yeah. do to anybody? Yeah. Like it, was like, it was like a new thing. It was bef right before the boomer memes, you know, and uh, it's like he just couldn't comprehend like what they did wrong. But at the same time, his generation, nobody, nobody minds talking bad about millennials and Gen Z or not yeah, and Gen Z. Gen X has gone re relatively unscathed. Mm -hmm. I and think because they're not on social media as much. Well, um, and baby boomers are in charge of the country. There's, there's actually a, gen, uh, and this is from kind of like a meme. To me, this makes sense. It's what I would consider myself. It's uh, in between Gen, gen X and millennials. It's zennials, right? It's the people when they were kids, the internet wasn't like a popular thing. So like from age one to like, let's say 13, the internet was not like in every home, right? It wasn't a popular. And you live through that period. You have memories of a time where everybody didn't have smartphones and you know, you use house phones and everything and you live through that whole time and you merged into through AOL and the messenger through, um, AOL, MySpace. So you went through this whole thing. You have this different perspective on life because you've seen life without it, but you're also not a boomer. You're not like too far in the past. You're old enough to remember your parents using a map to get around. You know what I mean? You're old enough. Whenever somebody said, Hey, take the second right after the exxon you know what i mean and then you take that third right on accident you're old enough to remember directions like that and you have this different perspective because because you saw the before and the after just right, briefly right. the before and they call that a zennial and I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly the framing but if you're born between like 1980 and 1990 uh 1980 and 1990 one or two somewhere around there um you have this different perspective. It's probably more like 1980 to like 1996. You have this perspective that's a little different because you're you're not like a straight Gen Xer. You weren't like having fun during the 80s. But so are, are you trying to say those people have like better perspective on things? I think that they have just enough. I think going into the technology, it's okay. I'll put it this way. Whenever I was growing up, on my birthdays when it came out, or my the day I was born, it was, came out like right around there. But there was this regular Nintendo. It was the first Nintendo, right? Whenever I was a kid, I played the regular Nintendo. The next gen was Super Nintendo Genesis. The controllers had a little bit more buttons on it. I had gotten good on the other controller, but now this new one came out. Mm -hmm. Then the next year, Nintendo 64, or the next couple of years, this controller is a little different. I had to get more advanced with it. Then... <laughs> The, you know, the PlayStation 2 came out. This controller had all kinds of extra. We gradually uh, grew up with the technology as it's improving. And I remember when I had right. like this Windows 3.0 PC um, with uh, Encarta 95, you know, Windows 95. I had maxed out everything that thing could do. I learned all of its capabilities. You know what I mean? And then I just got to learn. I, had, I got to grow up with this uh, household technology. And it, I think it made me better at you, like being able to pick up anything. Not everybody had access to this stuff, but my parents made sure that it was in my hands. You know, the people, the, the generation that was pirating music, they really dug into the weeds. And I think they just grew up with technology a little bit differently than everybody mm -hmm. else. You know, I could see that. Yeah, for sure. You're still growing up with technology. Uh, how old were you when you had your first P60? 
PC that you could play around with, you know, without your parents breathing down your shoulder? Oh, I don't like as an adult. I don't know, dude. Um, as a kid, Not an I, adult. Remember having, I remember having one as a kid with the desktop in the house. I don't remember how old though. And your parents just let you figure things out online? Pretty much. Yeah. With the uh, modem or whatever that would always like make that noise. Yeah. 56K. Did you ever like talk to girls in high school? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, like we had AOL and some messenger. So we're all talking yeah, about that. I remember that. I remember those yeah. days. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that's the zennial status right there. Is, is that a real yeah. term or did you make it up? Or is that a real term? I haven't well, ever heard of it. I didn't make it up. I can't take credit for it. But zennial. So are you All saying right. our generation is the, the more responsible or the better one that should be in office? Is that what you're saying? Um, you a better perspective, better outlook would, on things? I would just say we're the bridge. We're the bridge between the old and the new. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Um so we know from the past and we can understand the future. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we knew how <laughs> we're like cavemen who got light lighters later on in life. You that's know good, what I mean? That's actually really good. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's just like you, you learn how to do things uh, man, like a analog and now you have di you're in a digital world. So you just learn the reasons why things are the way they are, you know? Um, I used to have this friend that would tell me not to not to Google Maps everywhere because, like, what if you don't have GPS one day? And yeah. I was like, uh, well, we're in California, so I'm just going to go west to the beach and then yeah. figure out my way home from there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. North and south, too. Yeah. yeah. Easy. All right. Um, and I don't know any of these questions you're asking either, as you know. Mm-hmm. So, All right, so let me give you let me give you a scenario, and I stole this from Reddit, but I think it's a good topic because you love Reddit. Well, I just I think Reddit's a good place. Uh, honestly, Reddit's good for a lot of things. The best way to Google anything is to go like, "Hey, should I go with Orkin Man Reddit?" and or "Hey, um, is the Vent security cameras a scam?" Reddit. And you're going to just get the best feedback in the world. Google is going to take you on some kind of, I don't know, some kind of weird predetermined chart, uh, course. You know, I don't know. What's funny, I used Reddit earlier today because um, someone offered a, uh, made an offer on my listing through an email without it being a real offer. And they're called mm -hmm. Viva Casa, mm -hmm. Zoom Casa, Zoom Casa. And I went on Reddit and a bunch of people were like, scam, scam, scam. I don't know how true that is, but it helped me get, get a better idea not to even reply to that. Exactly. Person. But go on, go on. But I will say I, it's great for things like that. I, I kind of stay away from it from like a, a political worldview perspective because it is a mob. So for for ideological things, it becomes a mob. But for, um, you know, advice on right. business stuff, it's actually quite good. This is one that I find uh, I found interesting, which is. I need to buy a house and I have the money, but my real estate agent isn't helping me much. Okay. He doesn't send listings. Just waits for me to just wait for me to find something online, drive by, do all the research myself. Then we'll arrange a showing. I'm spending hours a day searching, but it seems he does <clears throat> nothing and just waits for me to find one so we can do a quick close and collect a commission. Is this hmm. the new way agents operate? When I bought a home 20 years ago, they did the research, then arranged an afternoon of showings on the best ones. Does anyone get this service anymore? What would be your advice for this fella here? Well, he, um, considering that is all true, what he's saying, or whoever Maybe, that is. Assuming it's all true. Right. It sounds like they already have a bias against agents and they're, they don't like them to begin with because he's kind of generalizing all of them to be like that. Uh, my advice is to open the landscape to what an agent is and find a better one. And it'll be like night and day between what he has currently and mm -hmm. what he can get, which is an agent that knows a lot of other agents in that region that has relationships with agents that they, he can, he or she can call them up, email them and get an understanding of what's going to hit the market that hasn't hit the market yet, just because of that relationship. Um, and that way he could start seeing homes that are, haven't hit the market yet necessarily, mm -hmm. or maybe um, his filtering system of what he's looking for in a home is too small and he needs to broaden it. And a specialist in real estate can kind of explain that 
and find more homes that might fit his, his uh, needs, essentially. And the top three comments are basically like, hey, I'm a realtor with a zillion years of experience. Fire, fire him. Yeah. Not all of them are like this. You got a bad one. Find a new realtor. Fire your realtor and find a new. Yeah. All I the agree. realtors are like, get out of that thing. This guy is lazy. He doesn't respect you. It, hey, look, the truth is it could be he's looking for a home that's like too low a value for the realtor to even for what the realtor normally wastes his time or spends his time on. Right. It could be something like that. We don't even know about. Right. But um, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, if your realtor is not going to put some work in, try to get a different one. So here, here's another scenario. Let's say I haven't signed any documents or anything, but I was on Zillow and uh, I, I saw this property that I liked. And then I hit the contact button and it set me up with the agent in the area to view the house. Mm -hmm. So we go out, we go view this place and I'm like, Hey, look, I'm just casually looking. Um, not sure if we want to buy or not, you know? And then they're like, all right, well, give me a call if you do. And you leave and you, you, you're like, you go home and you're like, we really like that place, but you know what? Our friend Andrew is a realtor. Are we wrong for giving our friend Andrew business? Or should we go through to him because he already invested some time in us, even though we didn't sign documents? I don't know. That's that's kind of hard to say because um, you you as the person clicked on that link, you got a showing from the, the the agent, and now you're telling that agent that you have a friend that does real estate. Is that is that kind of what? No, it no, is? no, no. You don't tell the agent anything, right? You're at home. You're back home with your wife, and you're like, you know what? I really like that place, but. Andrew's our friend. I know that realtor showed us the place that, mm -hmm. you know, from Zillow, but mm -hmm. we want to give the business to our friend. I see. So is it wrong to show back up with you? Like, hey, actually, we want to go with our friend. We didn't sign any document. We didn't sign any buying buyer's agreements or anything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. now, I guess in a way it kind of is. I mean, it depends on your intention. If you as the user that clicked on that link thought that that agent was the listing agent, I could understand. Um, and therefore they're showing their listing, but those people that you, that you, that you, when you click on it, those people are, are realtors paying Zillow to be on there mm -hmm. to be a buyer's agent. So I guess long story short, it is kind of messed up. It is towards that person. And you technically mm -hmm. should not use your friend because you should have had your friend in the first place helping you from the beginning. No, that's a good point. So let me rephrase yeah. it to you since we're having yeah. this conversation, Andrew, I'll give you the business, but the only way we're going to do this is if you give 5% of your cut to him. Otherwise, I feel morally responsible to go with this guy. You're my friend, though, so I wanted to offer this to you. Now what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd probably, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, otherwise, I'm not going to be able to sleep at night. So this is sucks. It's a terrible position I put us in, Andrew, but it is what it is. Um, you know, as an okay, so if I'm not that busy as an agent, then yeah, I would do it. If I'm pretty busy and I'm successful agent, I'd probably be like, try it with that guy on that house. If it doesn't work out, call me and I'll find you another one. And don't go out there clicking around doing showings. Mm -hmm. Let me take over. That's my job. You know, the truth of the matter in this market, especially the market you're in, by the time we're having this conversation, the house is already sold. So, um, yeah, it's, it's slowing down a little bit. Okay. In California, Southern California. Yeah. Things are sitting a little longer. But yeah, you're overall right. All right. So next question. Next question. Um, this one's a little bit more fun. You know, it's it's 2024. We're almost actually we're halfway through it. Um, tattoos are way more accepted these days. Yeah. Would, what would you advise someone who you know had a sleeve or so? Is it ever okay to really kind of show some skin? Maybe wear a polo. Um, is it something you'd only do around someone that you know is kind of in the same? Uh, culture is it something you would never do in a close never do in a first meeting is it something you would ever i know you don't have tattoos mm -hmm. but would you ever advise someone maybe it is a good opportunity to kind of show that like, maybe you're more relatable to them or something like that uh, i think it's a matter of just like being you if that's you and th th you have tattoos then that's fine um in a professional setting like if you're going to meet someone you ha you don't know anything about them you may want to like wear a long sleeve um because what what is the attire most people wear when it's a formal professional mm -hmm. setting? You wear a long sleeve of some sort, whether you're a man or, or a woman. Right. So I think I think that's probably the best case. Um, 
And I, I know plenty of agents that have tattoos and white collar professionals in general that have tattoos and it doesn't hinder their, their ability to perform um, or to get clients. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, I think more so the scope of this conversation would be more important of what you have on your body. That's visible. Mm-hmm. If you have a big F you on here, then, mm-hmm. you know, you probably should wear a bandaid and cover that up, you know, cause then that doesn't look very good. What if someone that had like a, ne- a neck tattoo of like their kid's name in cursive on their neck, right? And they said, Andrew, I want to become a realtor. Do you think I can? Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, I'm in Southern California and tattoos are like normal. So, and so um, do you, do you, are they dressed well or do they dress well? Do they have good hygiene? Are they, are they smart? Are they professional? Do they mm-hmm. speak well? They don't curse um then then yeah they, they they should do fine do you do you know any realtors with neck tattoos i know two with neck tattoos but they're more like behind the ear going down mm-hmm. or in back of their neck but i don't know any like with i don't think i know any like on the front mm-hmm. i don't think so so are you familiar with dave ramsey yep financial guru to some degree that's mm-hmm. not he's against debt in many ways one thing i like about him is he's not a grifter like you can yeah, who's a grifter in your eyes though huh who's a grifter before i i we go into that like who's number, a one, number one grant cardone no question <laughs> why are you serious i want the audience to know why you think that all right but i wanted so you... to ask you about grant cardone okay yeah yeah, yeah. so i'm gonna share it um stop sharing and then so i want you to please edit that up a little bit but you asked me why do i think grant cardone is a grifter coffeezilla one of my favorite content creators is going to lay it out three minutes look i'm so worried about you right now can you hear it yeah yeah the savings rate this month hit a low of 2.7 percent this is a unbelievable and ridiculous warning sign that I told you about last week. The person that has $236. Invest it all in yourself. You already bro. Don't hold on to $236. Our parents, they taught us to save money. Yeah, 100%. I want to bank cash, man. I need money. I need emergency funds. A safety net is one of the first goals any investor should establish a fund. We recommend that everyone should save right now towards some kind of safety net. It doesn't make any sense. Save your money. Prepare for a rainy day. It fucking don't rain here. I need to treat money like it's sacred. It fucking don't rain here. He said that. It fucking don't rain here. The savings rate in this country was over 6.5% for 30 years. Now it's collapsed again. What are you doing? I'll never forget. These guys pay $12,000 each to sit in that chair. Three days, I got to look at their ugly faces. Look, man, you're spending money on junk when you don't need it. Look at my little, look at my little, my little things, man. I got, I know guys walking around with five and six hundred dollar headphones, and I got my little freebies that came, came with my phone. Why? What's the difference? So this is a thirteen passenger Gulfstream. Uh, it retails for about sixty one million dollars. Truth is, most people don't like money. I know they don't like money. You know how I know they don't like money? Because as soon as you get some, you get rid of it. You buy shit with it. I mean, it's crazy when you start putting stuff on a jet. It's bizarre. Like this door was not in here. This door right here, believe it or not, cost eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars to put in. America is back to the savings rate that it was at back when we had this problem in two thousand eight, when people were buying Porsches and cars and country clubs. Dude, it's, it was out of hand. Uh, Ten years ago, all they used in these planes was really dark, heavy wood. Um, probably cost a million dollars to replace the wood. You know, my father told me when I was six years old, he said, watch the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. Okay, help me out here. A penny saved is? A penny is a penny. Okay, your mama got real complicated here. A penny is a penny, and if you spend time with them, you'll end up with nothing. When you watch pennies, nickels, and dimes, and quarters, when you watch that, you're going to pay attention to the younger there. People that are not disciplined with money don't end up with money. People that waste money on dumb things don't end up with money. There's something universal about money. Waste it, somebody else gets it. So if you're down to your last $1,000, this, this offer today is nine ninety seven. dollars All right, all right, all right. This is the kicker right here. This is, you know who this is, right? 
Yeah, the the guy from Shark Dam- Tank. Yep. Diamond, Dam- I think. Something. Damon, I don't remember. But yeah. So he's the uh venture founder, capitalist. Founder of Fubu. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And so they're about to say if you're down to your last thousand dollars, can you imagine someone's down to their last thousand dollars, right? And this is the advice you're about to give. Last thousand dollars. This yeah. this offer today is nine ninety seven. Grantcardone.com forward slash a shark. Okay. Yeah. You're down. A guy's sitting there right now watching this, and I'm. I got my last grand, dude. And I got Christmas coming. Should I got Christmas them? coming. Absolutely. Should you buy I'll it? tell you the same thing. Yeah. Grant Cardone is a grifter, straight up. I see. Yeah, I could see. I could see why you say that. I mean, I don't know if you saw his recent um, video with Vlad TV or uh, interview, and Grant Cardone says to people, "Never buy a single family home. It's stupid, right? Mm-hmm. Buy apartments, own that, rent." But he just bought a. I don't even know how much it was. Twenty plus million dollar house in Malibu that he just completely remodeled. Mm-hmm. And he talks about how much how expensive it was to remodel it, kind of like tying back into that video about his jet. So I, I could see that. Got to be careful with Grant Cardone, though, because he's suing everyone that talks about him on YouTube. Well, grifter is a subjective term. Um, and defamation means that he would have to think that I was doing it, um, I, that I didn't believe what I was saying. And mm. I think I just backed that case up pretty well, that I do believe what I'm saying. Um, I just think that when you tell a poor person, to spend yeah. the last thousand dollars on your get rich quick plan that you, that's um irresponsible and uh but the truth of the matter is is that people will pay money to him so i guess mm-hmm. keep keep on keeping being grant cordon i guess the point is to be smarter than to fall for those things right um right right anyway. I mean, it all depends too like how much can that thousand do for you if, if you can't even afford it just depends. It's all subjective. Like someone that's, I don't know, someone that hardly has any money, a thousand dollars a lot for mm-hmm. them. Someone that has doing okay, a thousand dollars is like not that much. So like might as well buy something and see if you can make money off of it by learning from this guy, Grant Cardone. So I don't know. Right. Well, um, this brings me to Dave Ramsey, who I find to be honorable. And this is a good example of it. He's admitting, he's admitting to wit. Uh, sorry, he's he's willing to admit when he's uh, being hypocritical intentionally on something. One question that's come up for me is I often hear you use the phrase, uh, the borrower is slave to the lender. And I definitely agree with that principle in many ways. But then on the other end, I noticed that when it comes to a mortgage, you are okay borrowing in that instance, which seems almost to betray that principle a little bit. And I guess I was just curious on your reasoning as to why you think it's okay to borrow in that instance. Pastor, that is a wonderful question. Of course, you're quoting the scriptures, Proverbs 22, seven, the rituals over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. And this is a biblical principle that we're violating when we say it's okay to take out a mortgage. And that's your point, and you're correct completely on that. It is the only hypocritical advice we give on this show. It's the only thing we tell people it's okay to do that I never do. But one question that's come up. And that's why I like Dave Ramsey. And and of course, the reason he's saying that is he never does it is because he's got cash. He's actually a boomer. He grew up in a boomer. Yeah, he actually grew up when it was... You didn't really have to do what you have. He's saying this because these days, if you want to get in the game, you got to borrow some money on that scale to get into the real estate game. Mm-hmm. It's just the only way to do it. And so that's leverage. why he's saying that's why he's hypocritical about it. It's just the right. way the system's set up right now is for this one thing. It's the only way you're going to make it happen. Right. You know. But uh, again, he's against like student loan debt and all that stuff. But that's the one thing. And that's important for real estate. It's it's kind of unfortunate that for me, it's like I got I was in the military. I get a veteran loan, which means I have to pay no money down. Mm-hmm. If you're like a 27 year old in, in uh, Southern California right now, you got to put how much down? Three percent, three and a half percent, at least. The, minimum. Wait, what, what's the minimum? Uh, three percent. Oh, three percent. I thought it was actually ten. No. That's the misconception that everybody thinks okay. it's three percent minimum uh, for a conforming loan amount uh, that's uh, 
basically uh, by backed up by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to put at least three percent down. Uh, anything more like high balance, then you got to put more. But overall, three percent, which covers most of the country. And the has that changed? Because I seem to remember back in like 2012, people having to save up like 50k, which is way more than three percent for like a four hundred thousand dollar place. I don't know. I don't know around that time. I I think it's always been three percent. Um, maybe during the Great Recession time, there was. A, maybe i don't know i was a kid so there was a time where maybe um you had to put more down um because the banks weren't providing loans i have no idea but everybody thinks you got to put a minimum 20 percent down or 10 percent down i don't know why but that's what a lot of people think um mm -hmm. but a lot of it is if you put less than 20 percent down you're going to pay private mortgage insurance and that makes things more expensive and it's frowned upon so i for example when i bought my first place i um I put, um, I think I put 8% down um, or almost 9%. So I had PMI, but my my um, credit score was good. Debt to income ratio was good. Um, and the PMI wasn't that expensive, right? And then within a year, I built so much equity because the prices kept going up. And that's kind of strategically, I bought a place that I knew was going to go up. And within a year and a couple months or even a year, I my PMI fell off. Mm. meaning I didn't have to pay for it because I had 20% equity already. Mm -hmm. So it's That's all planning. That is all so, planning. Um, so for a conventional loan, okay, so without private mortgage insurance, which why, why would you not get private mortgage insurance, right? Um, you typically need to make a down payment of 20%. So if you don't, if you want, if you get private mortgage insurance, then it's you can go down as 3% for qualified borrowers. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have it, it's twenty percent or more of the home's purchase price. What does uh, private mortgage insurance get you? PMI. It's an extra uh, insurance that the lender requires in order for you to put less than twenty percent down. So it's an extra charge uh, that the lender's putting on you because you're a risk mm -hmm. because you didn't have twenty percent to put down. Yeah, I think uh, Dave Ramsey. Yes, Grant Cardone. No. But here's the thing about Dave Ramsey and Grant Cardone. If you're trying to become a good uh, public speaker, if you're trying to be an exciting person, you're trying to um, build a brand, you probably want to listen to Grant Cardone. If you're trying to be more about money. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who's got a better brand? Dave Ramsey has a better brand. Yeah, you're right. He built a good brand, but Grant Cardone is larger than life and there's more people that know him than Dave Ramsey. And I think a lot of that is the character in terms of the personality. So who do you think sleeps better at night? Dave Ramsey. And sleep is one of the most important things for a human. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just think that. Uh, the, so and we've talked about this before, or I've talked about it before. Grant Cardone is trying to sell you his lifestyle. Right. That's his whole pitch is like. Um, if you spend money to me, if you give me money, you can be like me one day. That's his whole no way. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. He's trying to sell you him. Like, Hey, you will actually be Grant Cardone. If you just follow his 10 little tricks that are in this new book that weren't in the book he released last year, this is the 10 new tricks, right? Dave Ramsey has, cons has a consistent message of like, um, it's simple, stupid. Start, start with your debt, pay off your debt. Mm -hmm. Actually first get an emergency fund, then the snowball effect, pay off, you know, the smallest debt you have first and the next debt, because psychologically, once you start getting some of these out of the way, you're motivated to continue going on. You get your last debt at the end. And then you, you build up your 401k. And uh, it's, it's, it's always amazing listening to these calls because it'll be like someone there. And <laughs> they've tried to go to school three different times for $400,000 in debt. And they're an RN, you know what I mean? They never even got to be a lawyer or whatever they were trying to be, you know, and they just have a, this amounting, this amount of debt that's just insane. And right. if you follow his program, you get the opposite of what most people who, if you follow, if you were to follow Grant Cardone's program and you were to follow Dave Ramsey's program, you're going to see it through. One of them is almost guaranteed happiness. It's, like your debt's going to be gone. 
You may not be a billionaire, but you're going to be living free of any debt to society. You're going to, you know, you're just going to have a, a, a more yeah. healthy life. The what, odds what of, you, go ahead. No, I'm just saying the odds of your life being better under Dave Ramsey are just so much greater. It's, it's, Dave Ramsey is the father figure, the extra father figure. You might already have a dad. This is the extra dad. That's a good um, point. That's a good, if you don't have a dad, point. he could be a daddy for you. You know. <laughs> yeah, um, that's why. Like, if you don't have a mentor and you can't, you like mm -hmm. physically don't have a mentor around you, or you're in an area that doesn't have good mentorship for whatever reason, mm -hmm. or you don't trust anyone, I think he's a good one to go look at. Uh, Grant Cardone is that. Grant Cardone. Grant Cardone's that crazy uncle that's always showing up to Christmas with someone else. Yeah. You know what I mean? What do you and you're like, damn, you have a great life. <laughs> you know? I know. Uh, a lot of glam. What do you think of Patrick Bet David then? I feel like he's kind of in the middle. Well, no, I think I, 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 haven't, I haven't put Pat, Patrick Bet David in any kind of griff category yet. Um, I still think everything he does, he truly believes in. Um, I think he's authentic. I think... Uh, I, you know, I love his, uh, his background story, you know, how he got to where he is. And, um, I think he's always trying to push the envelope, but not in a, in authentic way. Um, and I like his programming. I think some of the people he has on there on his program, get into the little outrage a little bit too much, you know what I mean? But he's always been very even keeled. And I think he's willing to say things to people that he truly believes that, in a way that's not like Rudy Giuliani, you know what I mean? In a way that's like, I just feel like he's, he does have principles. Is he perfect? He's not perfect. But I do think he's always trying to figure out what that is, what perfect is, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think he's willing to sit down and have a conversation with anybody. You can respect people who are willing to sit down and talk to anybody. Um, that's and true. He's, he doesn't go into like name calling and stuff, you know, um, so yeah, I think he's a good guy. I, I, I think he surrounds himself with a very diverse, I, from an ideological perspective, group of people. And, uh, yeah. So have you seen CoffeeZilla about talk? Is it CoffeeZilla? Is that what he said? Yeah. I, did he say something about him? I have no idea. Yeah, he did. And then look at Reddit, PHP, his agency, um, like a pyramid they're calling it, but I don't know. I think the guy is definitely a force of good for the Is, country. Was that before now. he started his entertainment network? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. First, that's kind of what got him uh, yeah. the, the funds to do what he wants and the, the mass growth of an audience that yeah. got him to become who he is today in a way. Um, so there's like, there's like all sides of the coin for everybody. I've heard bad things about Dave Ramsey. I've heard great things. It's the same thing for Grant Cardone. Same thing for Patrick and David. So I guess it's just a matter of like deciphering it and picking the good from the bad of every you know, person. The bad things I've heard about Dave, Dave Ramsey though are like he's mean to people. It's like for me, it's like I don't really mind. I, that's what I need him for. I like... I don't need the person giving me financial advice to be concerned with my feelings at all. This is numbers. Right. You know what I mean? We're talking numbers. But anyways, I could see PBD doing some grift stuff in the beginning. I could definitely see that. But I would say that him and Grant Card Cardone, it appears, um, have an opposite yeah. trajectory. Where Yeah, I don't even think they're friends anymore. They used to be friends, I believe. Now yeah. they don't like appear on each other's uh, network. Just imagine like you're in a room where you pay twelve thousand dollars to be in, and Grant Cardone's like, These ugly people pay twelve thousand to come sit in this room with me, and you know none of them are gonna be millionaires. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like just I can't even imagine that. Like how insulted if you're not insulted, then stay there, stay in that room, you know. So I, I won't catch you at a 10x event. What's 10x? 10x is uh, Grant Cardone's like uh branding oh. for like you know, being large in life and like going all in financially. The 10X rule, the only difference between success and failure. And then he's got another book. Oh no, no, it's not it. It's not, it's not his book. There's another book by someone named Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan. 10X is easier than 2X. How world-class entrepreneurs achieve more by doing less. And there's also the 10X health system. It's a protocol. 
Put 10x book by uh, Grant Cardone. Yeah, I saw it. I don't do know. You think, do, do you think that a success book is, is what it takes to get somewhere? No, not really. It's not going to be in a book. I mean, books are great. Books have great knowledge and perspective. Don't get me wrong. But if you're ever reading a book going, how can I make it to a million dollars? It's not going to happen that way. Yeah. You're not going to find A lot of those it. people yeah. keep reading books, keep staying motivated, keep going to seminars, keep doing all that. Not always, but a lot, a lot of people, I think a majority of those people keep doing that and they just never put it into play. They just keep trying by trying mm. to relearn all this but they never put it into play and take action. That's the dangerous part. Okay, so there's someone, this chick that I knew in the Navy, and at, by this point in her life, she's probably been in like eight MLMs, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. before I even really, I think I might've heard of an MLM once or twice. One day she texts me, and we're both still in the Navy at this time. Multi-level marketing, so for people that yeah. don't know. Yeah, pyramid scheme. And... So we've like been on dates and stuff before and all that. So there's like a history with this. But one day she texts me and she goes, hey, would you like to be a part of my new business? And I'm like, yeah, what's up? What is it? And she's like, well, how about this? Tuesday at this time, meet me at a ho this hotel. And I'm like, this hotel? Like, what is this? going to be kind of some kind of scene or something? What are we doing? You know? And uh, she's like, no, just show up there. Uh, wear nice clothes. I'm like, oh, my God. You did it? Yes, yeah, so I show up there, right? And I walk into this conference room and oh my God. I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who think they're going to be millionaires, right? Yeah. And I walk out with like 10 seconds <laughs> in that room. I'm like, okay, I see what this is. And I bounce. And she texts me and she goes, you didn't come? And I'm like, that's a pyramid scheme. What are you talking about? I didn't go. Like I, I came, I showed up and I realized what it was. She's like, oh, you just don't want to make money. I'm like, I guess so. She's gone to like five or six MLMs after that. You know what I mean? Damn. And she's like, why I've been to one of those too. Why do MLMers have to be so shady about what they're doing? Just tell me what it is. Hey, what's your business? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I had like another friend from the Navy, right? It was right. We're both out of the Navy at this point. And he hits me up on Facebook and he goes, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm like, man, I'm doing great. How are you? He's like, I'm doing great. I just started a business. And I'm like, oh, I'm interested to hear this. And I've genuinely said, I know you wouldn't join a pyramid scheme or anything. So what is this? And he's like, it's not a pyramid scheme. And he blocked me. <laughs> I was like, oh, all right. yeah. All right. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, damn. Like, so well, I'm people known... want hope, man. People want to, no matter how often people talk about pyramid schemes, they, they, people want hope and are hoping what they're in is not that. <laughs> and they mm -hmm. just want to have that hope. That's all people, some people just have that sliver of hope and they're going to do everything they can endlessly to follow that light. And, yeah, I just uh, wish somebody would hit me up like, in the planning phases of MLM and ask me because then I'm on board. Yeah. Don't call me when you're the uh, 10,000 member. Like, Hey, do you want to join? Call me when there's like 10 of you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm trying to be at the top of the pyramid. 